Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 304 of our Tick Bootcamp podcast. The title of today's interview is Numb, an interview with Grace Anderson. My name is Matt Sabatello. And I'm Carly Taylor. I had the honor and privilege of bringing back one of our first podcast guests, Carly Taylor, to be my special guest co-host on this podcast. Carly taught me so much when we interviewed her almost two and a half years ago. And again today, she brought so much to this interview and taught me so much about how to recover and heal from Lyme disease. Hey, Tick Bootcamp family. I'm so excited to be back here and co-hosting. Grace is such a powerful, powerful person. I was honored to be able to interview her. Uh, she was a kid when she was sick, uh, as you'll hear, and she has gone through a roller coaster of a journey from all different diagnoses and just different healing modalities. It's a wild ride and you can really see her strength and how passionate she is about just digging to find the answer and is really trying to share her story so she can help others. It's a really, really powerful episode. So without further ado, we introduce Grace Anders in NUM. Welcome to the Tick Boot Camp, Grace. So excited to have you here. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, so excited. Excited to hear about your story um, and where you are now. So let's kick it off with um, a little bit about your background so we can you know, find out who you are. Um, where do you live? What do you do? And whereabouts did you grow up? You want to give us that background? Um, so I currently live and grew up on the coast of Maine. Um, cool. And currently, I'm not doing anything but going to school. Um, yeah, sorry, instantly Lyme brain. Yeah, no, that, no, totally normal. Um, and how old are you? I'm 21. Awesome, cool. Uh, what are you studying in school? Uh, mental health and human services. It was one of the only things that really grabbed my attention and I could do the entire thing online, which is really helpful with me and my health currently. Oh, that's amazing. Has that always been an interest of yours? Yeah, um, I've always loved psychology. Um, that music and English have always been the things that have really grabbed me. Oh, that's awesome. That's really cool. So kind of on that subject, um, what are some things that you um, are really into, some dreams, goals, or things that you pursued prior to getting sick? Yeah, uh, well, when I was growing up, I wanted to be a musician so badly. Um, I wanted to be Taylor Swift. <laughs> That was my goal in life. Um, but now um, I, I've always loved songwriting, but I realized that what I like more is like short stories and things like that. And I'd really love to write uh, both a novel and an autobiography one day. Oh, that's amazing. Um, and for music, uh, do you play instruments or singing or just love listening yeah. to it? Um, well, I do sing, but I'm not good at it. That's <laughs> just, all right. I'm sure you're great. Just simply because um, I enjoy it. Uh, and I tried playing um, guitar, but my hands were too small for it. So I ended up playing ukulele. Oh my God, that's so awesome. That is really cool. I I've, I've have the same issue as well with my fingers not really working on the guitar. <laughs> so I should probably try the ukulele. That's that's amazing. Um, <clears throat> so you're um, with music, are you doing any of that still now? Kind of like in um, at school or is that just kind of more focused on like mental health right now? Yeah, uh, well, I don't um, take lessons for that anymore. Uh, I stopped doing ukulele lessons a while ago. Um, and I go through periods where I don't play, um, but then suddenly I'll get the urge to and I'll pick it up and start playing again. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, we can get into that more in a bit. Um, so you said you live in Maine. Um, you said on the coast, is that correct? Awesome. Are you like right near water or are there, are there like woodlands around or what does that look like? Yeah, um, the town where I, uh, my parents are divorced, so uh, I grew up in two separate towns, but um, the town where I went to school, you can see the ocean uh, from just about anywhere in town. Oh my God, that's beautiful. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's awesome. Um, really, really cool place to live. I'm also from New England, so that area is just 
amazing. Um, and you currently live there now. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. All right. So kind of, uh, you know, how going to when you first saw symptoms or felt symptoms, um, when was that? Uh, how old were you when you first got sick or the year, how many years ago? Yeah. Um, so I'm honestly not sure if I had any symptoms prior to this, but uh, the first time it was, I kind of uh, say this is really the event that started it all. Um, I was 12 and it was the summer of 2013. Um, I was at a Taylor Swift concert and um, I remember I was walking towards the stadium with my dad and I looked at my feet and they looked like they were like miles away. It looked like um, like in Alice in Wonderland when she looks at her feet when she's growing taller. That's kind of what it looked like to me. Um, and then all of a sudden I got this wave of dizziness and uh, some nausea and I soaked my clothes in sweat. And um, like first thought was dehydration. Um, so it took a while, but we got through the gates of the stadium and I got some water, uh, but I just got sicker and um, I ended up in the first aid station. Um, and I spent about two hours there I would say. Um, and then Ed Sheeran was opening for her. And when he was playing, I said to my dad, because I was throwing up, I was so dizzy that it was painful um, and still completely soaked in sweat. And uh, I said to my dad, like, I think I just want to go home. And we uh, started leaving and he helped me get up to get to the car. Uh, and as soon as we walked out of the first aid station into the stadium, I was totally fine. It was like it never even happened. I felt perfect. Um, like I was a little cold because um, my temperature had dropped so much. But uh, besides that, it was fine. And I ended up staying through the whole show. Um, and then a month later, almost exactly a month later, it happened while I was at uh, my best friend's house. And then a month after that, it happened while I was at school. And after that is uh, when it was really apparent that something was wrong. And I started having daily symptoms, fatigue, fevers, um, some lightheadedness, uh, uh, headaches, um, stuff like that. And uh, they did a bunch of blood tests. Um, they found out I had Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Um, I think my antibody number was supposed to be nine and it was 900. So obviously wow. <laughs> something wasn't right, right there. Um, and when I heard that, it was like, so all I have to do is take a pill and I'll be fine. Like, cause that's how you treat Hashimoto's. It's just one pill a day. Um, but I continued to get sick and, um, then, uh, it just, I continued showing daily symptoms and it eventually got to a point where I could barely function. I wasn't in school anymore. Uh, they had me in tutoring twice a week and I just continued to get sicker from there. And uh, nobody really knew what was going on. I was diagnosed with migraines, um, but I went to uh, an endocrinologist when I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's and um my mom said to him like this doesn't explain everything like what about all these other symptoms she has that are not symptoms of this and he said oh well that's just anxiety and he put that on my chart with no proof of it so wow. the, the doctor did that the doctor put it on the chart yeah and that's wow. um that's what people started paying attention to when I went to new doctors so it took a really long time for someone to take me seriously. Wow. And when you said um, you weren't in school anymore, was that in uh, like what age or grade was that? Like, uh, that was seventh grade. Wow. You were really young. Yeah. And um, really not feeling well. I'm sure when all of your other friends were feeling great, having tons of energy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Everyone I knew uh, was doing perfectly fine especially because a few times i got sick when i was with my friends and like uh the time i got sick at my 
best friend's house, we were previously like jumping around to the new One Direction single and everything was fine. And then suddenly I just crashed. Like I felt like uh, the whole world was spinning or really I was spinning. <laughs> um, and I just got sick after that. So Grace, hearing this and being told it was all anxiety. And unfortunately, when I heard you describing your symptoms at the concert, right away I thought, I've heard this story a thousand times. It's so frustrating, but they're gonna say it's anxiety because they're gonna run the test. Nothing's gonna come back. It's not gonna fit anything perfectly. And of course, your endocrinologist said, hey, you have Hashimoto's, but all those symptoms that don't fit, that's just anxiety, but Hashimoto's is what's causing some of your symptoms, right? Did you, did your family, believe this? Did you believe this? And how did this impact, you know, your view of your illness at this point, right? Because when I was told it was all in my head, I couldn't help but let myself think that maybe I'm a little crazy. Maybe I do need to go like, you know, spend some time away. Maybe I do need some mental health medication because I just wanted to feel better. Right. So how did yeah. you, how did you respond to that? What was your response to that statement? Um, well, later on, I did start to question whether like I had some anxiety. Um, but at the time I was so sure that something was wrong and they weren't finding it. Like I knew that if it wasn't all the things they tested me for, then it was something else, like something is wrong with me. And of course they, they didn't know me. They thought I was just like a kid who wanted to get out of school. Um, but that was not the case at all. Like <laughs> maybe I would have faked like a stomach ache to get out of a day of classes, but I would have never done this. And, um, something was definitely wrong. And uh, my parents believed me 100%. Um, they never had any doubt that uh, I knew what I was talking about. What about your friends? Did your friends believe you were as sick as you were? Or were they thinking that maybe it was just, again, anxiety, depression, and more psychological issues than physical issues? Yeah, uh, I had some friends who, I, I was never an active person. Um, I was never like into sports or anything. So I definitely had people think it was just cause I wasn't active enough. Um, but, uh, I don't, I don't know if anyone thought like mental health issues. Um, but I had a lot of friends also who believed me and who knew something was wrong and who saw it firsthand. And I think the people that, um, thought like, well, maybe you just don't move enough and stuff like that. Uh, I think that opinion changed after I got sick at school because I was with all my friends when it happened. So. so let's talk about this, you don't move enough statement because for me, it's crazy even hearing that, right? How is, how is you not moving or you not being active enough going to cause you to have these crazy real physical symptoms right so like why do you think these people were making these wild assumptions about you and sort of writing off your sickness because you weren't active enough right like where do you think that came from um i'm honestly not sure uh but we we were pretty young at the time so i think it was just like well that was the first thing that like popped into the, their heads the first thing they knew about me was that i didn't like sports and stuff like that so i think they just kind of went with that, if that makes sense. I don't, I honestly don't really know where it came from. It does. And I, and I just want to ask a question about the mental health piece here as well. And then Carly's going to continue on. But, you know, it's, I find that I find this topic so fascinating because we talked offline before we started this podcast that before I got sick, I really didn't, I was a little impatient with people that had anxiety and depression and psychological conditions. But now going through this experience, I can appreciate it much more having had those symptoms myself. And many people are afraid to speak up and say, hey, look, I've had anxiety. I've had depression. You know, in general, we, those, those things should not be stigmatized where we're afraid to, to vocalize them. But beyond that, we just interviewed last week Dr. Alan McDonald, who's this brilliant pathologist who does, um, in, in addition to looking at blood under the microscope, he actually does biopsies of organs and, and brains. And he's found a direct connection between bacteria in our brains, parasites, Lyme bacteria and different strains of Lyme bacteria, Borrelia miyamotai can cause different symptoms psychologically than Borrelia burgdorferi. So we're starting to barely scratch the surface to understand what these pathogens, what these tick-borne illnesses, and even what, what different species of Lyme itself can do to the human brain to cause anxiety, right? So I just, it, I just want to make sure people listening know 
that it's okay if you're anxious, it's okay if you're depressed, and that we need to verbalize these things and not worry that we're going to be labeled as crazy because these are symptoms that come along with having Lyme disease, right? So Carly, on that topic, if you can help me transition here, but like, I, I know it's something that I struggle with. Is that something that you had to deal with as well? And I'm curious how it affects females differently than males. Cause my experience, you know, being in my twenties when I got sick is far different than, you know, your experience, Grace, when you were 12 and your experience, Carly, when you first got sick as well, right? Yeah. And that, that's why I was uh, so shocked that you were so young and had to deal with that. I was in my twenties, late twenties as well. Uh, and I feel like uh, with with being sick and not knowing what's going on gives you even more anxiety on top of the already ha having the symptoms of that anxiety of of physically things that are going on um for me i think that anxiety uh ran in my family for so long and it was a lot more understood and i guess uh accepted in a way and just gaining tools was always something that i was really focused on so i was pretty prepared as i was experiencing even more with being sick. However, I don't think you're ever prepared for the feelings that you're having. And I would always think, I remember feeling like people weren't gonna believe me. No one ever said that, but it's always, I feel like an automatic thought or feeling that, oh, if I can't go out, people are gonna be like, oh, sure. Uh, yeah, she's just making that up or she's being dramatic or whatever that may be. Um, I was lucky that I never got anyone saying directly they didn't, but I always felt that way. And I think that's probably something a lot of Lyme patients go through. And uh, I mean, your story, that, that is that is so powerful that you were so young. Um, it's such an impressionable time too for you uh, to be going through that and having people actually not believing you. Plus on top of it, I'm sure you were having that feeling being like, wait, what's happening? Like, like what what is going on and I, you're also dealing with Hashimoto's at this time or what they told you was Hashimoto's so as a young girl that's a lot to take on um how how did this get in the way of you being a kid uh kind of explain of uh, you know essentially being a kid and and any of like those dreams and goals and things that you love to do then how did like how did that how you were feeling interfere um it didn't interfere a lot at the beginning um because it it was um it started as these episodes that uh would come like once a month and then uh that was it the rest of the time i felt fine uh but then i started getting daily symptoms and i mean i obviously like i said i uh had to stop going to school and that affected me um quite a bit because i was no longer with my friends every day and um at first i really enjoyed it because i always thought it would be so cool to be like homeschooled and that's basically what i was doing um i did see a tutor twice a week but i did most of my work at home and um i really enjoyed that but i mean um both my parents worked my brother went to school and so uh, i was alone a lot um like sometimes i went to my grandparents or uh, i saw other people um but for the most part i was um not really around people let alone people my own age so i started um feeling pretty lonely because of that um and as far as like things i enjoy doing um it got to a point where i couldn't really like a uh since we lived right in town in this small town um we used to walk downtown after school i couldn't do that anymore um i remember uh one time i tried to um but we were shopping at my house beforehand and by the time we got there i felt too sick to do anything uh dizzy nauseous um just worn out so um in those ways uh things changed, but um, as far as like music goes, that didn't really change that much at first. Um, but over time it did um, because I uh, was just having such a hard time like um, with instruments, like moving my hands, uh, but also like, <laughs> cause I wanted to be Taylor Swift so badly. So I, uh, I used to like, dance around in my bedroom and a lot of people like uh will sing into a hairbrush uh my dad's a musician so he got me like an actual microphone 
And um, one time I was doing that, this was years ago. Um, and I suddenly felt just so dizzy and off balance. And um, like, I couldn't feel my legs all of a sudden. Um, and I didn't have very well, very much control over them. So um, that was kind of like a shocker to me that I could no longer do things that I loved. Like it was one thing to uh, stop going to school and stuff like that, but to uh, not be able to do something that I've done basically my whole life that I absolutely loved, that was really hard for me. Yeah, and that is I'd say one of the hardest parts is having your life change so much. Um, and just why so many people just don't stop till they find an answer. Uh, so we left off with that doctor putting anxiety on your record and them just, you know, first saying Hashimoto's, just giving you a pill and then having it go to another doctor saying it was, it's anxiety. And you all know that it could be more. So take us through where you went from, from there. Yeah. Um, so my mom, um, went to my primary care doctor who said like anxiety like didn't want to even see me again um and after i had collapsed at school i was actually taken straight to the doctor because they wanted to see it when it was happening so um that's exactly what my mom did uh she took me to the doctor's office and they saw it and saw how scary it looked and um how like just really sick i was and still even after that the doctor said oh it's it's just anxiety like people have seizures from anxiety like anxiety can cause anything so that's probably it and um or he was he was actually pretty sure that was it um but then my mom went to him and said um that she wanted me to see a neurologist and there was a neurologist at um our local hospital that had a good reputation and she um insisted that i get into him so uh they got me into him and he didn't know what was wrong but he could admit that he didn't know what was wrong and that alone was really big for me he could say like i don't know what this is uh i can refer you here and maybe they'll know um because he he wanted to get me into boston children's hospital i think at the time i was like 14 and um my primary care doctor um that office had refused to um, refer me. And uh, I can't remember um, exactly what was said, but I remember like sitting down with the doctor and knowing exactly where it was going. Um, and it went something along the lines of like, you know, it's been a while and nothing has changed for you. So maybe it's not real, <laughs> like maybe, this maybe you just have anxiety and um she then said she wouldn't refer me to boston because boston was a dead end um but my neurologist um referred me to neurology at boston children's and they got me in pretty quickly um and they didn't find what was like the source of it all but they discovered that i was having seizures which no one had been able to tell me beforehand. Wow. They, so how, how did they discover that? Did they do some kind of scan? Um, I honestly can't remember. <laughs> um, I just remember her uh, saying like, I think you're having seizures. Um, and I don't know if she said that based on my symptoms or what, but uh, after that I went and got um, an EEG and uh, they kept me, awake all night and then had me fall asleep and they uh put the thing on my head and uh there was seizure activity so she was right wow and how old are you at this time um i was 14 i think a few months away from being 15. wow that yeah that that is so young and so where from there where was the diagnosis what doctor had had figured this out was there many more in this in this journey or or were you close yeah. together um well something that um i feel like i should have mentioned earlier is uh when 
I was getting told at the very beginning, like this isn't real, like you're imagining this, uh, you're faking it, um, it's just anxiety, you're mentally ill, all that. Um, I remember sitting down at the table with my dad and my brother, and um, my brother asked like, what do you think it is? He asked me and I said, uh, I think I have Lyme disease. Like, I just felt like that was what was wrong. Um, I don't really know how to explain it. I just had this like feeling in my chest, like it felt right. Um, and it was one thing they tested me for, but it was negative. Um, and then he asked my dad, like, what do you think it is? And my dad said, I think she has Lyme. Um, so after getting diagnosed with seizures, um, I feel like there was this period where I didn't see as many doctors, like um, they were focused on the seizures, but they didn't wanna treat them because they thought seizure medication would make it worse, especially because they had diagnosed me with the type of seizures that people usually outgrow by the time they're 18. Um, so they didn't want to really mess with that. Um, but my mom uh, knew a naturopath who is also like Lyme literate and she she's very smart and uh, has a lot of information on Lyme. And so she tested me. Uh, and at this point I was like two, three months away from being 16. Um, and she tested me and with a Western blot test and it was positive. And so that was kind of when I reached that diagnosis. How did you, how are you aware that Lyme could have these types of symptoms? Cause I didn't know that it could be like this until I had a cousin who had like debilitating Lyme, couldn't walk, was a marathon runner, was bedridden after that. Um, and I had, I had no idea. How did you know? Did you know somebody who had it or hear yeah, about it? I, well, at first, uh, when I was so sure I had it, I didn't know anyone that had dealt with wow. it. I, I grew up in Maine and, um, like I was always told, um, especially by my, my grandpa, um, like every time you come back inside, check for ticks, you don't want to get Lyme disease. Like, and I, <laughs> I always like almost prided myself on the fact that I had never found a tick on me because bugs like are just attracted to me for some reason uh, mosquitoes fleas if there's one in like this huge house it's gonna find me um but i had never had a tick on me and when my grandpa grandma brother when they all came in from outside they were covered in them and i never was um and then so like i i grew up being told about that and every doctor's office has uh, signs like Lyme awareness and uh, what to look for and stuff like that, which is why when this happened and I, I thought I had Lyme and I had, had mentioned it uh, to my primary care doctor, I was so surprised that it wasn't taken seriously because it, when you don't have it, they make it seem like this huge thing. And then when you might have it, they like kind of push you to the side. That's what it, that's what my experience had been at least. Uh, that's that's fascinating it's probably because they don't really know what to do if you have a diagnosis all these doctors they just know that they're told to be aware of it so that sounds like you actually never saw the tick bite that would have made you sick actually, I don't even have it, so. actually i remember the tick biting me which is very unusual i guess um yeah. it's very uncommon but uh it was may 2013 um and I'm surprised I remember this because that day I had gotten uh, some, I don't know if I got a tooth pulled or I got something done on my mouth and um, they had to put me under for it. And uh, when I came home, I was laying on the couch watching a movie uh, with my brother and my dad was cooking dinner and my head started to itch. And um, I don't really remember what happened, but I remember like, uh, lifting my hand, scratching my head and feeling this little bump. Um, and then next, like, next thing I knew I was holding this bug and I said, like, what is this? And, um, my brother leaned over and he said, I think that's a tick. 
and my dad came and took it and it seemed like okay well that's the end of it like i didn't expect to get sick from it i was surprised i had a tick on me because like i said i never really did um but it just seemed like that was over and i didn't expect anything to come of it i didn't expect to get sick grace what drives me crazy about this story is you and your family family were lime aware you live in a lime endemic area you had a tick bite you you and your dad thought you had a lyme disease you got a lyme test which was negative your symptoms progressed but they said oh it must just be anxiety besides hashimoto's and everybody knows lyme tests are horrible right again another thing we just learned last weekend is there's a term called sequestering where the lyme bacteria actually will use your immune system's response to coat the spirochete and protect itself right and when it does that your your body eventually stops creating antibodies and therefore you won't test positive so yeah. there's this whole concept now that's being developed within the last year, but it's been known in Europe for, for even longer that the Lyme bacteria is so smart that it's going to result in far more false negatives than we ever thought before for Lyme disease. So this is something that I think we need to catch up with. But despite all that, that, that groundbreaking discovery, how do you think it got you know lost in the cracks between all that, you being Lyme aware, you living in a Lyme endemic area, you got bit by a tick, like, why were your doctors so like breaking their neck to not look at Lyme disease, do you think? I'm honestly not sure. Um, the tick bite was something that I had forgotten uh, when I first got sick. And it I remember uh, remembering it some time later, um, but it still didn't seem to change anything. The fact that I remember that. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm I'm really not sure why people were so insistent on um, not like digging deeper into it. Uh, I had my primary care eventually like said, actually, I don't know if this was the first time I brought up Lyme or if it took a while. Uh, I, I'm not sure about that, but at some point um, she prescribed me antibiotics and uh, she had me on antibiotics for two weeks. And was it then, doxy do you recall what type of antibiotic you know i don't remember i feel like doxy would be the go-to um, when you were young maybe amoxicillin possibly possibly yeah i'm i'm not sure i i'm not sure if i ever knew i just took it because they told me to um but it yeah um i took that for like two weeks and then it was like okay well you're not cured so it's not lyme and then were you, they, did you feel any better at all did you feel anything from the antibiotics? Um, you know, I don't remember exactly, um, but I remember at the end, I was still pretty sick. Uh, so I don't know if it really made a difference at all, um, but I definitely, something was still wrong by the end of it. Most of my symptoms were still there. So I think this is just another example of a misconception, right? These, this is a Lyme fallacy where if you have Lyme and I give you two weeks of antibiotics, you should, you should feel better. And if not, it can't be Lyme disease. I just had uh, on Wednesday this week, a colleague come into my office in a panic saying, I just found this tick biting me while I was using the restroom, had it in a baggie. It was on it for three days and had a complete panic attack. And just, just today, now there's a bullseye rash. And her, her, you know what her doctors are telling her? Take one doxycycline pill and you'll be cured. You won't get sick. You have a bullseye rash. You have Lyme disease. One pill of doxy is not going to cure you of Lyme disease. And I know people listening to this are going to think, well, there's a study out there that suggests one doxy right after a tick bite will prevent Lyme from, from tr being transmitted and disseminated in the human body. But that study has been disproved over and over and over again to be not accurate. And beyond that, it may suppress early symptoms, but it's not getting rid of the infection. So it's actually making, it's making things worse for you, right? So in that case, I feel like you're, in, in my example and in your example, it's further solidifying the belief that it's not Lyme or you're, if it were, you'd be better, but yet it was just almost making it worse for you, right? I mean, what do you think about that looking back now at that two weeks of antibiotics that you took? Yeah, um, well, first I just wanna say, um, of, I think like two years ago, my brother texted me um, freaking out and he said, I just found a tick in my foot. Um, like, what do I do? And um, I said, well, remove it. And um, I, I can't remember exactly what I said after that, but at some point I said like, go to the hospital or go to the doctor, go somewhere and um, see what they can do for you. Um, 
and he went and they gave him two doxy pills uh one in the morning one at night you'll be fine and he said that he could not believe how it was dismissed um and i couldn't either uh it was just yeah that shocked me because that was the first time i had heard of them doing that um but yeah um but looking back on me taking uh two weeks of antibiotics i understand that that really didn't prove anything it didn't prove that i i wasn't sick or that it wasn't lyme disease um because it just it wasn't long enough and especially because i had probably had it for a while at that point so like it wasn't like i had just gotten bit like the day before so for sure yeah. i mean so walk us through though how you went from going to all these doctors from the time you were 12 to now almost 16 you finally had a decent neurologist who referred you to boston children's hospital i believe you said where you got diagnosed with seizures you kind of sat with that for a little bit but then it sounds like your mom i think you said right referred you out to a naturopathic doctor who ran the western blot and you tested positive is that correct did i miss anything there okay so did you did your mom turn to a naturopath because she was so desperate and you were getting worse or was she you know, did you have a tendency to non-traditional medicine? Because it's hard to make a jump from, you know, traditional doctors to a naturopathic doctor, you know? Yeah. Um, well, my mom has always been into naturopathic, homeopathic remedies, stuff like that. Um, and uh, this, my mom's a hairdresser and uh, she did the hair of this naturopath. And um, I knew the naturopath, I had seen her before for other things. Um, and my mom knew that she was, um, like literate in Lyme and she knew what she was doing when it came to that. So, uh, and she knew that, um, I guess she talked to her and uh, found out she would uh, give me a different test than Penn Bay did, which is the local hospital. What did, what did they, did they do the ELISA? Is that what they did when they ran the test and it was negative earlier on? Um, I'm not sure, it, it was an antibody test, but okay. yeah. So just just to kind of zoom out and time frame this right you were sick for at least four years from the time you were 12 to 16 because 12 that was the taylor swift concert you're 16 this is five years ago now you're 21 today you finally get a diagnosis from the naturopath you have evidence you have proof you have lyme disease do you bring it back and throw it in the faces of all of your we your western doctors or did you say screw that i'm just going to stick with this and stick with the naturopath where do you go from there um well i'm so i'm not sure when it happened but sometime in that period of time i left my uh family doctor and found a new primary care um and he didn't exactly know what was going on either but he believed that something was wrong with me and so um i finally had a primary care who uh would actually look into this stuff for me um and i'm not sure um what happened with lyme when i uh, was a patient of his. Um, I'm not sure if I went to him. I honestly can't remember. Um, but yeah. So Chris, I have to ask at this point now with the naturopath, because Hashimoto's and autoimmune disease are very, very, very common with tick-borne illness and chronic Lyme disease. And there's a lot of theories, right? We've discussed this with a lot of leading doctors and experts in the field. Some believe that, you know, autoimmune predispositions genetically can cause you know, make you more likely to, to develop chronic Lyme, which is maybe a factor why some people can get Lyme and recover more quickly than others. Some people believe that the tick-borne illness can actually, you know, can actually be a, a, a trigger for the autoimmune itself. But like, what were you thinking or what were your doctors thinking? Did they even see or think of a connection between the two when you first got diagnosed at 16? So um, when I got diagnosed, no one really thought of any connection. Um, yeah, I... I don't think anybody put it together. I, I kind of did myself in my head, like, well, this actually makes sense that like the tick bite was the start of it all. But actually um, when I was a baby, I had health issues too. Um, and I had constant infections in my kidneys because the flaps in my kidneys were underdeveloped um, and they couldn't figure out what was going on. And then they'd treat me with antibiotics, but then I'd get thrush. So they'd have to stop the antibiotics to treat that. And it was just this back and forth. And at some point, um, an infection went too far and I became septic. And that I think damaged me really early on. Um, like I uh, 
can barely see out of my left eye. <laughs> and I've always had some muscle weakness and stuff like that. And I think that was a big part of that. And when, um, when I was young, I'd just like randomly fall down. And I think um, it was probably that like muscle weakness. And um, I also found out later on that I have a uh, small fiber neuropathy. And I think that started at that point too. Um, and then when I was 12, I got uh, bit uh, by the tick. And I think that kind of overloaded my system. And um, I think it probably, I don't know if it caused Hashimoto's or it brought out Hashimoto's, uh, but I think it played a part in it. Um, and also uh, my migraines too, which is my, the main thing I deal with now. Um, I was already like genetically set up to have migraines. Like my great grandma had them, my grandma had them, my mom had them, uh, my brother had them. So um, I came from a family with really bad migraines. Um, and then I got Lyme disease and my migraines just started getting worse and worse. And uh, they continue to get worse somehow, even today. I think you just described that so well. I know you just described that so well of how you had all these other things going on with your health. And then when you got Lyme, it just really was the straw that broke the camel's back, right, with your health. And that's kind of what you just described for us. But I do want to bring in Carly here as well, because one of my worst symptoms was migraines. I had an entire summer where I had debilitating migraines. And after work, if I could even go to work, I would just be in a dark room and I just couldn't, I could barely function. And I know Carly has provided some brilliant tips on how to how to respond to migraines that she's we've actually reshared on social media and that we've used personally so if we can just pause for a second i'd like to see what carly's views are on on the migraine topic because that's extremely common with lyme and and if you guys can talk about what tips or tricks you can recommend to people listening that suffer with migraines because i i have to say probably 95 percent of people with chronic lyme have dealt with headaches or migraines in some form or fashion yeah headaches was one of my worst symptoms uh, it comes back a little bit now, but not like it was when I was at my sickest and it was every day and mine were like a squeezing feeling. It felt like someone was trying to squeeze my brain. Um, and then it would get worse and worse or turn into a migraine where everything hurt. Um, so that was one of the things I focused on the most when I was healing and then something that I would share out. And a lot of it feels like it's tension. And I would always almost feel like spirochetes, the bacteria were like, at the base of my head almost just causing havoc and making everything really tight and squeezing um and which also led to a lot of jaw pain too because all of that is connected um i i would try to release a lot of tension in the bottom of my neck or the top of my neck but the bottom of my skull that helped a ton and just like using a lot of relaxation techniques uh, that helped me a lot on like essential oils um, and um, homeopathics. When you mentioned that, my my mom was also super into natural homeopathics, and um, we we turned to that really quick when no doctor could figure it out. So I relate to that a ton. Um, but there's a lot of homeopathics that um, also help to like refuel your cells because your cells get so dehydrated when you're trying to heal the bacteria really sucks everything out of you, your body's in overdrive. Uh, so just getting stuff that helps get hydration back on the cellular level. Um, there's a little homeopathics there. I have, you know, in my reel, I think I talk specifically about what those are. Um, and then doing like acupressure. So there's even just like massaging it with your fingers or acupressure mats help a ton with those, uh, with headaches. Um, and then trying to get like blood flow as much as you can, but Headaches has to be one of the most debilitating things because it's just in your eyes and you can't focus. Um, and that's that's something that is very noticeable when it gets better. Um, but you know, in the moment, it's really just giving yourself grace to rest, relax, and try to like relieve that pressure. So I don't know if you tried any of those things or um, anything else that helps headaches. Yeah, um, I haven't really found anything that is like it makes a significant difference, especially when it gets to a really debilitating point. Um, like I have symptoms with my migraine that I didn't know were possible. Um, like my body goes numb. I have this like feeling that I can never really describe, like no, no words I say really like do it justice, I don't think. Uh, but I get really dizzy, like major vertigo, actually, it's more than dizziness. Um, and like, 
everything's spinning. Whenever I try to move, um, I feel like I'm being pushed back down and I get like head rushes. Like I'm, I feel like I'm falling off a cliff over and over again. And uh, at that point, all I can really do is just go to sleep um, or it just gets worse and I start throwing up and all that. Um, but I also have like uh, visual disturbances and major headaches. Um, I've gotten the like squeezing headaches, um, but I've also gotten headaches that are like really sharp pains, which actually I call uh, Lyme headaches because I only seem to get them when I'm struggling with Lyme specifically. Um, like when that's really bad, uh, that's when I get that type of headache. Um, and yeah, so I haven't found anything that has like really worked. I'm currently on two prescription migraine medications and I take Tylenol and nothing really seems to help. Um, but I was just referred to a headache clinic at Mass General. So I'm really hoping that they have some ideas. Well, we definitely wish you luck with that. And I, just to share some things that have helped me, right? I mean, I was on I was on so much prescription migraine medication as well. I mean, and that one summer, I can't tell you, my neurologist tried everything under the sun and I was on combinations, different things, and it was just, nothing was working. But for me, I think a big part of it, to Carly's point, was when I started to really heal and not just heal from Lyme, but whole body healing, because it's always more than just Lyme disease, right? When I started to heal my body, I noticed that my migraines were getting less, you know, less significant, less powerful, and they were, they were becoming less and less frequent, but some of the tools I love the most are peppermint oil, you know, I, I, whether it's, you know, the Tara Young Living, I'm not an, I, to me, whatever, whatever works, right? But peppermint oil on my temples, the base of my skull, um, that really, really helped significantly for me. And the ice packs, I would use cervical ice packs, which were, were really powerful for me also to just get, take the pain away. And in addition to that, CBD oil. For me, that was like right when I started to get better, I would take CBD oil in, in high quantities. I mean, I would take, you know, probably about 25 milligrams, you know, at a, at a time. And within a, within a few days, I noticed a significant improvement in my migraines and I still take CBD oil. You know, I try to take it every day, but honestly, a couple of times a week, just, just almost preventatively, you know, for maintenance now. And that's been very helpful as well. So I did, I just wanted to share that with you, Grace, and everybody else that's listening to this podcast, because there are a lot of tools available. Some of them will work for me, they won't, and they'll work for you and they won't work. So I just think there's a lot of things out there that we should all be aware of. Um, and when you do, if uh, you know, go follow through, if there are things, you can definitely do a follow up on this, Grace, and you can let us know. And what we can do for our listeners is update the show notes. So if somebody's listening to this and this is down the road and it's you know, a few months after the launch, check the show notes and we'll be sure to update you with anything that we get from Grace down the road as well. If you're if you're willing to share Grace as you make more progress in that area. So, all right. So now let's come back to, you know, your diagnosis, right? So you're finally diagnosed. You're 16. It's five years ago. Are you, are you still homeschooling? Are you able to be able to actually, you know, get through all of your homeschooling or are you totally just now home and debilitated? Well, um, early, earlier, like a, I think the year before that I was diagnosed with Lyme, um, through my uh, seventh grade year and my eighth grade year, um, I was pulled out of school, uh, given a tutor, put back in school part-time and then put back in full time, like multiple times. They were pulling me out and then like soon after putting me back in, like uh, trying to get me back into school, but each time it would fail. And then I started high school and um, I was going to go to school half days. Um, and that wasn't even working for me. I was too sick and I had, um, the school for some reason had this like electric scooter that they just had so they let me use it and so I didn't have to walk around a lot and it still was not enough I was in school um in September and I went to school a total of three days and none of them were even next to each other <laughs> um and I actually I had to miss my first official day of high school because I was having inner ear tests done um which didn't show anything but uh after that, they uh, pulled me out of school and got me actually the same tutor I had had the year before, so I already knew her. And um, they had, I had a friend actually who was going through um, something as well. And so she was uh, in tutoring with me. So it wasn't uh, like I was finally around someone that was like my age. Um, and right before, uh, 
Christmas break, we had this meeting. It was me, my parents, my teachers, um, and uh, the school nurse. And they had this meeting about like where to go with me. And there was this moment, it was when we were leaving, they said that they wanted me back in school after Christmas break. And I was totally panicking. Like, I can't do that. And I mean, it's hard to deal with this anyway, but to deal with all this when transitioning to a new school is even harder. And it was just, I knew that I wasn't ready and I didn't know if I ever would be. Um, and I was feeling like really nervous about that, which didn't help at all. Um, but the school nurse, as we were leaving, she pulled me aside and she said, um, you know, even if you're feeling sick, come to school anyway. And that to me was like, kind of when I knew that they didn't understand and they could never fully understand without going through it. And even if they did go through it, their experience might be different to mine. Um, but uh, that was the moment that I was like, okay, I need to take more control of this. And um, actually I was, I was listening to uh, a song um, one night, uh, me and my dad were driving home and uh, there's this band I really like called Automatic Love Letter and they have a song called Circles. And in it, um, the, the lyrics say, uh, you can't run in circles at everyone else's request. And that really like hit me when I first heard it. And I kept replaying that song and listening to it. And then I was like, okay, I know that I'm only 15, but I have to change something. Like I'm only 15, but this is still my life and it's my education, it's my future, it's my health, and I should be the priority here. So I um, talked to my mom and I said, like, I really want to go to an online school. And I looked up uh, different um, schools and I found one almost instantly that I really liked. And she told me to talk to Martha, who is a friend of hers, uh, very smart. And actually um, when I was, really sick uh 15 16 um i spent a lot of time at martha's because she had had lyme also and she understood it and she had been really sick mm -hmm. and she was actually the first person i called when i got my diagnosis um but uh my mom said go talk to her and see what she thinks and i think my mom thought like she would say no but i went to see her the next day and we called the school and got all the information and uh she said that she would help me enroll if my parents said it was okay. And um, I talked to my dad that night and he said it was. Um, and my mom, um, she, she said it was, but um, she wasn't feeling well that night. So I think she just said that to like get off the phone because then she seemed, she seemed a little upset about it. Um, I think she was worried because she had heard that like when uh, kids go online, they have no one like supervising them. And so they just don't do the work and they don't get it done. But uh, I ended up switching to online school and I was able to do it all on my own. So. Wow. I, I really love the, I think you said it was, you can't run in circles at everybody's request, right? Is that what you said? Yeah, everybody else's request. Yeah. At everybody else's request. I'm actually writing it down because I just think that's so powerful because so many of us with Lyme have been through there, right? Where you're running in circles, everybody's telling you what to do. It's the whole, have you tried this? Have you tried that? You should do this. You should do that. The judgmental piece, doctors not believing you. And when you have that epiphany of, I'm not going to run in circles at everybody else's request, that's when you start to listen to your body and make the changes that are going to help you get better. And it sounds like at this point, everything came together. You got your diagnosis 16. You, you you had this epiphany from the song, thank God. You decided to take control and get online schooling so you can focus on your health. And now I'm excited to hear what comes next because you finally have a, di a diagnosis and you started to treat. So tell us, Grace, what was your treatment plan with this naturopath once you got your diagnosis? So um, she had me on multiple antibiotics, I think. Um, honestly, this period of treatment um, isn't as clear in my mind as other periods. Um, but I remember I was definitely on Doxy. Um, and I think she had me on a few other things as well. And uh, she um, had me on like uh, different vitamins. Like she said, I had the 
second lowest vitamin D she's ever seen. Um, so I was on that uh, vitamin B complex, um, stuff like that. And, um, you know, I think uh, when you get better gradually, it's kind of hard to notice. Um, but I definitely think that some Lyme symptoms went away, but I continued to get sick. And uh, I was dealing with um, like some uh, lightheadedness and um, still with the sweating and um, some headaches and uh, just having a really hard time like moving around. Um, and in, at the end of 2019, uh, I got a diagnosis of POTS which explained so much. They had me do a tilt table test and in uh, two minutes, my heart rate went from 89 to 140 just from standing up. Um, so that, that was uh, what came next. And my doctor said she couldn't formally diagnose it, um, I guess because in Maine, they're not really allowed to do that. Um, and then, uh, she just told me like um they'd get me into a pot specialist and until then eat lots of salt uh drink lots of fluids drink lots of gatorade um and she put me on a blood pressure medication which really just made things worse every blood pressure medication i've tried has made things worse but eventually they put me on a tenolol and that helped my symptoms a lot like it didn't cure them or anything but it did help them a lot um but after that <laughs> um in 2020, uh, the, I think it was like June, um, I started feeling really sick and I was getting fevers and um, like all my joints hurt so bad. I couldn't even lay on my bed without a heating pad. Um, I could barely move. Everything just hurt so bad. And uh, I was on the phone with my mom one day and I said, like, I, I haven't felt this way since I had Lyme. And that just kind of like a light bulb went off in my head, I guess. And I was like, I have Lyme again. That's what it is. So Chris, um, I'm sorry to interrupt real quick. So the time frame was you were 16 and, and how in 2020 is about two years ago. So you were like 19. So this is three years, about 16 to 19. Okay. I was 19 at that time. So when you were 16 and you treated with the naturopath and you had the doxycycline, the antibiotic cocktail, and then all the vitamins, and then you got diagnosed with POTS and you found that one treatment that actually, can you say that name again? I'm sorry, the, the name of the one thing that helped you with the POTS? Atenolol. Atenolol, okay. So sure. it sounds like you actually felt better. So do you, did you feel like you kind of got your life back between then and the time you hit 19 when you started to feel sick again? Or was it just sort of, it got better and plateaued and you just kind of accepted that as your life at that point? Um. Yeah, well, it, it didn't make so much of a difference that like everything seemed to go back to normal. Um, it helped uh, my heart rate a lot. Like I no longer felt like my heart was gonna explode just from walking upstairs. Um, but then I started uh, like, I continued to feel um, like a little off balance and um, some muscle weakness and stuff like that. How long were you on the antibiotics for when you first started them when you were 16? Um, I want to say a month. And then you, you did you stay on the vitamins and all the other stuff? Was there some sort of like maintenance regimen you were on at that point? Yeah, um, I think over time uh, I kind of stopped taking it all together because I did um, have like other medications I was taking and it kind of seemed like um, I didn't need it as much and it was kind of pushed to the back burner. Um, but yeah, I uh, I continue to um, go through periods where I'm not on it and then go back to it and continue taking like vitamin D and vitamin B and stuff like that. So you were on and off the, what I'll call the maintenance regimen for, you know, vitamins and things like that, but you were off the antibiotics and you thought you had the Lyme somewhat under control. Yeah. If you don't mind me asking Grace, what medications were you taking besides that? Cause you said you were taking other medications and, and what were you taking them for? Yeah, um, well, the one that I will always remember because I'm still on it is levothyroxine for my thyroid. Um, and over time, I had been on so many medications, just different things they were trying. Um, 
So, I mean, at one time I was on Topamax uh, for migraines and all that did was put me in a 24 hour migraine. Couldn't even get out of bed. Such bad vertigo. I couldn't even sit up. Like I missed like a week of my life just completely from being on that medication. Um, and there were multiple other things that um, I was on and off of. Like I was on uh, meclizine for a while uh, for dizziness. It didn't really help. Um, but it it could like take the edge off, I guess, uh, if I remember that correctly, because it's been a while since I've been on it. But yeah. So so you really you were feeling better. You were taking things on and off to address the symptoms, but you still weren't symptom free. You were still trying to manage various symptoms tied to Lyme disease and other things probably going on in your body. But when you hit 19, I think around 2020, you said is when you really crashed again, right? So you had that second crash. Talk to yeah. us about the crash. You know what symptoms came back, how bad they were, and then what you did then. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure if it hit me all at once or it came on gradually, but I just remember one day it like hit me that, okay, something is wrong. Um, I'm dizzier than I normally am. Like at that point, dizziness wasn't really a thing for me. It was more lightheadedness and just kind of like being off balance, but I wasn't really dizzy. Um, and that came back and I, I was feeling sick to my stomach, which is very rare for me. Uh, the only times that I ever feel sick to my stomach are uh, like when I have the flu or something, um, when I have some type of virus. Uh, but other than that, like the only times I throw up are when I'm so dizzy that I throw up. Um, besides that, I don't really deal with that. So that was new and um, I was, I had such bad joint pain. Um, my hips hurt so badly. Uh, and um, what else? I, I was having fevers again, which I hadn't dealt with in a while. So that was kind of like something that stood out above other things. So at this point, when you started to realize that things were getting worse, you're 19 years old, and you know, it sounds like this is the beginning, beginning of COVID as well, right? So it's a scary time in the world. You're developing these symptoms. What do you decide to do? Do you go back to your naturopath or do you decide to go look for another doctor to help you? Well, it took me a while to get there, um, but I did end up going back to the naturopath. What I originally did um, was when, when I said to my mom, like, I, I haven't felt this way since I had Lyme, it kind of clicked in my head at that moment. And I was like, oh my God, that's probably what this is. And, uh, I went to my newest primary care doctor who I had just started seeing like that year, right before COVID hit. Um, I called the office and um, she, the first thing they did was get me scheduled for a COVID test. And so I got tested for COVID um, and it was negative, of course. Um, and then I was feeling like even worse, dizzy dizzier than I had been and more nauseous and in more pain. And um, so I uh, called my doctor and they told me to go to the ER. And I thought like, normally I avoid the ER, but I thought like if they're telling me to in a case like this, like, well, maybe they can help. Um, and I went and I got really sick while I was there. I was so weak. I couldn't even open my eyes. Um, couldn't lift my arms because I was so off balance and I felt like I was going to fall over. I was throwing up and I could barely even communicate with them. And they were talking about releasing me. <laughs> um, and I asked them though, when I was there, like, will you test me for Lyme disease? And I knew it was probably going to be negative, but I thought like, well, might as well, because uh, they were going to take some blood for some other stuff too, I think. Um, so they said, I noticed how quickly they said, sure. And I, I wonder now if like that had to do with the fact that this time I was over 18. So they didn't see me as a child anymore. Um, but yeah, it was negative. And um, I went home and uh, I continued to get sick and I uh, called my doctor again. And I said, like, I think, I really think I have Lyme disease. I haven't felt this way since I had it. And um she said, okay, well, I'll test you one more time. And she sent me to the hospital and they tested me again and it was negative. And um, then it was like, okay, you don't have Lyme, you're fine. I'm not gonna see you again. I'm not gonna talk to you again. And that was it for that. So 
um, I thought back to when I had Lyme before. And uh, of course, now going through it, I know more now than I did when I was 12 years old. And I, um, so I tried to like think, what did I do then that made a difference? And I remembered like it was the naturopath who diagnosed me. So I went uh, and I called and made an appointment with her and I went to see her and I wasn't even in her office yet. It was July at this point. So it was hot and I was wearing shorts and I was standing in the doorway of her office. She was walking behind me and uh, she said, how long have you had that rash on the back of your legs? And I answered like, a month, but I think I had had it longer than that. I just, I, I had seen it before, but I wasn't really sure how long I had had it. Um, and she said, that's the Bartonella rash. And she, she explained to me why they weren't stretch marks. <laughs> um, and just with that, she, she knew what was wrong and she tested me for Lyme. And actually I, I did test negative for Bartonella, but she said like, you have the rash. I'm, I'm sure you have it. Um, and, uh, she tested me for Lyme and that was positive. So she tested you for Lyme and, and Lyme was negative. I'm sorry, Lyme was positive and Bartonella was negative? Yes. So obviously you had Lyme again, whether you were reinfected or it was just active again because it was, you know, possibly dormant or just sort of, you know, sitting below the surface, right? But the yeah. Bartonella is, is, you know, Bartonella and, and Lyme together could obviously wreak more havoc. So when you realized you had Bartonella too, I'm curious, like, did you even know what Bartonella was? Because before I got diagnosed with Lyme, if you said to me Bartonella, like, what the frick is Bartonella, right? It's like, did, did you, what was your thought when you heard Bartonella? I had no idea what it was, but the way it sounded, it just sounded like it would correspond with Lyme disease in some way. Just, yeah, the way it sounds, it just, it, in my mind, it was like, okay, it's like a co-infection or something. Um, and she, she explained it to me, but before then I had never heard of it. So now at this point, you're really, really bad. Probably the worst you've been, it sounds like. And you go back to your naturopath, you have an, a positive Lyme test and you have a clinical Bartonella diagnosis from the clear visible rash. What are you doing now to now start to climb back from this, this decline you had? Yeah, um, well, we tried to go back to my primary care doctor and have her look at the rash um because then uh, my insurance would cover the treatment and all of that but she refused to even see me um this she, is your new primary care doctor right the one that you just yeah um and so that got nowhere and so it was like okay i'm just i'm gonna get uh i'm gonna get treated and um so they she did start treating me and I was on uh, Doxy, Rifampin, um, and other ones that I cannot pronounce the names of. Um, I think I was on a total of like five antibiotics. And actually one thing she gave me was um, to, uh, like you mentioned earlier, like Lyme disease kind of builds a barrier around itself. Um, and one thing she gave me was specifically to break that apart. So more and, like a biofilm buster, probably, right? Yeah. Do you recall what that was? I'm sorry to put you on the spot. I don't know. I know there's so many, so many things out there, so many things that we take in our in our in our journey. It's hard to remember them all. So when you when you're taking these five antibiotics and the biofilm buster, I mean that's a lot to take at once. Did you did you herx? Did you feel worse? You know, walk us through what happened when you first started treating with all this stuff. Yeah. Um, well, because of uh, like the Bartonella. Um, the treatment was longer this time. Um, I can't remember exactly how long, but I was being treated for like a few months because um, it was probably going to be more aggressive and it was, um, and it took a while, but um, I did uh, get sick on it. Um, I remember feeling very sick to my stomach. Um, like I uh, had to make sure that I had a meal like a full meal with every dose or else I would uh throw up and um yeah it, it was it was pretty harsh on my stomach especially um and I think I think the joint pain got worse before it got better um and I was still having fevers but eventually uh the Lyme specific symptoms started to go away I was still left with like what my pots and migraines caused but uh I think at that point, the 
Lyme symptoms had started to kind of disappear a bit and I was feeling better, like uh, no um, excruciating joint pain or things like that. So now at this point, you're 19, clo closing it on 20, you're 21 today. Walk us through the rest of that time gap there from the time you started your treatment through where you are today. Did your health continue to improve when you went off the antibiotics? Did you do anything to maintain your health? You know, any tips or tricks you can give our, our listeners to, you know, combat any sort of declines you may have or stressful periods in your life? Just anything you can share with us about that time period. Yeah, um, well, Actually, um, after getting treated for this in 2020, feeling better in that way, um, I started getting the symptoms again at the end of 2021. And uh, I went back to my doctor and she tested me for Lyme and it was not, it was a Western blot test and it was not quite positive. Um, but she had also given me a questionnaire to fill out. Um, and it's like, if you score like a 52 or higher then you likely have Lyme disease. And I scored a 73 or something like that. And um, I mean, I'm, I'm from the coast of Maine, so it's not uncommon. And uh, then, yeah, I also, I had the symptoms that I had um, previous to it. And uh, I had also at the end of 2020 got another Western blot test and um, there was only like one bar on it. So it was clear that the treatment had worked. Um, but this time in the Western blot test, there were four. So even though it wasn't quite positive, it really seemed like it was back. Um, so when you say it was back, Grace, do you think that you, do you think that it just was never really gone but being managed but it came back to make you sick again or do you think you were constantly being bit and reinfected and you didn't even know it by ticks where you live yeah well the first time i think the first treatment kind of wiped it out and then i got bit again and that's when so I. so from to, you think at 19 you got bit again right when that when that happened again with the bartonella is that what you're saying yeah. okay but then um, from 19 to 20 it, you think what i think at that point i think it just came back um, I don't know that for sure. Um, like there was, but I know in 2020, there was something, I don't know what it was. There was something about my test that made my doctor say like, this is a new infection. So, and plus I had never been diagnosed with Bartonella before and there was nothing indicating Bartonella previous to it. Um, but yeah, with, uh, from, uh, in 2021, um, I actually, I got diagnosed at the beginning of this year for the third time, uh, that infection i think it just came back i don't think i was bit again but i don't know i might be wrong about that so just this year when you're 21 you get a little sick again and you get and you test positive again or this is where the bands were just just below the positive mark yeah just below the positive mark but clinically and obviously you know that you had lyme again with your doctor right so that's this year walk us through i mean this is like this is like um a merry-go-round right like you're you're getting lyme it took you it took you six years in the beginning to uh, well six uh whatever well i think it was about six uh four years i'm sorry four years in the beginning 12 to 16 to get to get diagnosed but then you you had a reinfection it sounds like from 16 to 19 and then 19 to 21 it comes back so are you doing anything differently because identifying that it sounds like maybe you weren't reinfected again but it just kind of came back but with more of a punch how did you change it up to treat it this this most recent time when you were you know 21 just this past year um, this most recent time, I think, uh, same antibiotics. Um, and I think I know the, the second time I was infected, uh, it was longer treatment and more antibiotics than the first time. Um, and this time, um, I think it was the same antibiotics. Um, I don't think the treatment was as long, uh, but I think I also took more uh, vitamins and, um, stuff like that. And, uh, they had found out that I was anemic. Um, so I was on iron and stuff like that, which, uh, I think was, um, I think my doctor thought it could be related to the Lyme. So, uh, I was on a lot of stuff like that. Um, other than that, not too much was switched up this time. But it sounds like you were finding other things going on. And as you were balancing out your various things in your body, right? Iron, et cetera. You were, you were building this 
better body to be able to defend itself, right? And that's that's what it comes down to a lot of these times. So you're 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 getting a better feel of what's going on in your body. You're addressing those things and giving your body a fighting chance to fight back against Lyme and allow your immune system to do what it was designed to do, keep you healthy, right? So that's kind of what you were focusing on each step of the way. And every time you had a relapse or a setback, you would hone in even more, fine tune things, hit it hard with your aggressive treatment again, and then reassess, right? That sounds that sounds like what I'm hearing from you. Is that is that a good assessment? Do you think it would happen throughout your yeah. your various up and downs? Yeah. So I do want Carly's going to jump in shortly. So I just want to I just want to highlight that you know the, the the way we found you is your your Lime advocacy page, and you also have, we know you have a TikTok in the limelight on TikTok. We know that you have a personal Instagram, the Hey It's Grace Thirteen, and you have your your Lime Instagram, the My Lime Life Thirteen, and you've done a lot throughout your illness to help advocate and help others, right? So you're advocating for, for Lyme awareness, but you're also helping others with their experience and you're giving back while you're sick, which is really powerful. So just give us an idea of when you first started getting into the advocacy world and why you decided to start helping other people, even though you were still so sick. And, and Carly's gonna to talk to you about, you know, what you're doing today with your health and also how you kind of had the transformation to give back and help people in the Lyme community. Mm -hmm. um, well, I don't really know when I decided that I wanted to advocate for um lime awareness and stuff like that it just it felt like it kind of came naturally um because i just think about like all the stuff i went through and i really wish that i had some of the information that i have today um and you know i i think about how i really was not taken seriously and um so i wanted to do something um that would possibly help someone like I knew there was no guarantee that I would help anyone, but I figured it was better to at least try um, and something that really hit me um, was I was watching. Um, something um, some virtual event from the global Lyme alliance and they had all these kids talking about being sick with Lyme disease and that really struck me because I was just a kid when all of this started and um like I remember how like terrifying that was and um I yeah I just wanted to do something that could potentially help someone feel better about it and actually uh in the future what I want to do with that is um I, like I mentioned, I want to write novels eventually. And uh, I really want to write a book where, with a main character who has Lyme disease, because I realized that there really aren't any that are fictional. So I wanna create a character that goes through that, um, probably someone really young, like a teenager, or something like that, um, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing that Lyme is not, represented in any kind of story like that so that is such a brilliant idea and I love that it's something that you've loved for so long and that was your passion and you can take this lesson and now integrate it and then use what you've been through and combine it with your passion that's amazing kind of on that subject what kind of describe other parts of this Lyme journey and and what it's taught you about yourself um and just, I guess yourself in the world and just going through a lot of the suffering. I know you still are in a way. So what, what has it taught you just about? Um, it's taught me um, a lot about, I guess, empathy um, for people who go through things like this. Um, it's taught me that I know my body best. <laughs> um, and although I may not always understand what's going on with my body, like I, I know when something's wrong. And um, like, I know my body better than all these doctors who told me that nothing was wrong just because my labs were normal. Or um, I also, I, I have a family history of anxiety. So uh, that only played into it. Um, so those are the two main things. It also taught me a lot about um, mental health and what it can really do to someone. Cause there was this one point where, um, I was dealing with a lot of mental health issues. Um, I had depression, anxiety. Um, the only thing that I like, the only mental health problem that I actually have that has not been caused by anything as far as I know is I have OCD. 
Um, but I was depressed and had generalized anxiety. And um, I think it was caused by Lyme or it might have not been caused by the disease, but what the disease did to my life, like, because I was not really around people very much and stuff like that. So that I think played a part in it, but they uh, tried to put me on all these medications. Um, one made it work made it better until it stopped working. And then everything else was just horrible. And um, so it taught me a lot about what this can do to someone and um, that like, it's not easily fixable by medication and medication with mental health is really not one size fits all. So that was something that I learned with this. Yeah, that is, that is an amazing point. And yeah, there's the journey of Lyme can really affect uh, mental health as well. And they really go together. Uh, what advice would you give others who are in the thick of healing Lyme disease and other tick-borne illnesses? You've been through so many ups and downs and back and forth, and uh, it just shows a lot of your strength. What advice would you give someone going through it? Um, you know, I'm really not sure. Like, I don't have any um, specific advice about treatment or anything like that. Um, but like to my uh, point that I just made, like, you know your body best. Don't let anybody try to take that from you because um, chances are they don't know what they're talking about because um, they're they're not in your body you're the only one that is so you're the one going through this and if you think something is wrong it probably is I love that piece of advice that is so powerful because I think a lot of times patients or anyone who's sick they don't know what to do and they put so much of it of the knowledge and um, taking so much of whatever doctors say that they forget you're the one who knows best. I drive that home so many times. Like who knows your body best? It's you. So I think your story is so powerful that you just knew and having that knowing. And even if it's not something data on a piece of paper from a test and you're just like, oh, well, I have this feeling that is so powerful. Sometimes that is beyond some test that comes back negative most of the time and false negative. So I think that piece of your story is going to be so powerful for people to hear because they may have that feeling as well. And maybe they don't trust it because they're not a doctor and the doctor told them. And I love that. That is so, so powerful. And I think everyone who is in the Lyme world would probably agree with that once they've kind of discovered that it is, they are the ones who are their own advocate. Um, yeah. So I love that. So powerful. Um, all right. So final two questions. So uh, one, if um, if a loved one came to you with a tick biting them on their leg, what would you recommend um, they do so they're not suffering? We've probably learned a lot. Uh, you probably learned a lot in your journey, but what would be like your first thing of advice? It doesn't have, have to be anything like um, like super scientific or anything like that. Just kind of what would you tell them? If, like Like your brother did, like when he came to you, but now. Well, the first thing I told him, because that was the first time that it happened, someone had come to me and been like, there's a tick biting me, what do I do? Um, but my first piece of advice um, is usually just like, remove the tick and put it in like, um, I think like vinegar or something. I can't remember now. My mom always did that um, to kill it and uh, keep it away from and make sure it doesn't get back to you or anybody else or any pets or anything like that. Yeah, you definitely don't want, yeah, especially, oh my gosh, you don't want another bite. Um, and this is my, uh, so that's that's the question they usually will end uh, their shows on. And my question kind of going on with your uh, book, and this may not be your book title, but what is one word, or it could be like two words-ish, that you would describe your whole Lyme journey with? Um... It could be your maybe potential book title. <laughs> Funny, because I I have thought about naming my book this. Um, I actually have two names that I'm trying to decide between. Um, and this might not make too much sense, but um, it it does um, to me in my body. Um, is numb. Mm, no, totally. That 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 makes so much sense. And when you said a lot of your feelings was 
like you tingling and having that feeling um, and just that feeling pushing you to keep wanting to not feel numb, like having having that extreme feeling just keeps wanting you to find answers. So I, I, I totally understand that. Um, but this has been amazing. I've absolutely loved your story. I can relate to it so much and your strength is absolutely astounding that you've been on a roller coaster literally back and forth back and forth um and still trying to find answers and push through and that you are here sharing your story so many people uh will be helped by this so i really appreciate it thank you for having me this was great and i just have to say grace thank you so much for joining this podcast i want everybody to know who's listening that we literally called you two minutes before this podcast started because we had an opening and Carly and I were like, let's just find somebody on our wait list. And we called, we called you up, Grace, and you just killed it. So we all the normal prep that goes into a podcast by the guest and by the interviewers, we just winged this. And this was a brilliant podcast. I just want to thank you, Grace, for being so, you know, brave to come on and do this. And I want to thank Carly for just being such an amazing co-host and being willing to do this without any kind of preparation. So both of you have been amazing. Thank you so much for what you brought to the community and always doing what you can to give back and help everybody in the online community. So thank you both, Carly and Grace. Thank you. Thank you. This has been great. Thank you for listening to our Tick Bootcamp interview with our guest, Grace Anderson. First, if you'd like to learn more about Grace, please check out her Instagram at heyitsgrace13 or at mylimelife13. Second, if you've enjoyed this episode of the Tick Boot Camp podcast, please share it with your friends on social media. Third, Tick Boot Camp has created a Tick Bite blueprint that has been inspired by the information that has been shared with us by past podcast guests. We urge you to visit our website at tickbootcamp.com slash bite to view the blueprint. Fourth, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts or Spotify to get your automatic episode updates of our Tick Bootcamp podcast. Please take a minute to leave us an honest review on your podcast platform of choice. And finally, if you'd like to search our podcast library of over 300 episodes, subscribe to our email list or share feedback, please visit our website at tickbootcamp.com. Thank you as always for listening.